Hello and welcome back to the Drive Formula podcast. This is our deep dive into chapter nine and I'm really excited about this chapter. We really start talking about how leaders can dive into what their employees need and how to best get the most productive, basically fuel your employees. Yes. So before we jump into it though, Remember to get your copy of the book, Driving Engagement. Um, it uh, will allow you to make notes, to follow along. Uh, even if you prefer the audio, this enhanced audiobook version, buy a copy and share it with a friend. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. It would help us out a lot. And if you have read it, please go and leave a review. Uh, that also helps the algorithm, helps get our book out there, our message out there to people. So we would really appreciate it if you would do that. So... Again, our enhanced audiobook last week's episode was a reading of chapter nine. So this week we are deep, take a deep dive of things that we talked about, maybe things that didn't quite make it into the book, but we still feel are important. And we'll expound on some of the ideas that we had in the book. So let's jump right into it. Uh, I think one of our, one of the examples we used in the chapter is you wouldn't buy a new car and then immediately clip all the wires to the lights in your dash so that you didn't have to see all the indicator lights like no one would do that no so why would you do that with employees because if you want to create the right environment as a leader you need to start looking at the indicators body language uh, verbal language i mean how the people are producing and not blame the the employees but think about what are you doing to fuel your team just like you fuel a car to get the production out of it it's the exact same thing. You build a culture, that's the fuel to be able to have your employees thrive. Yeah, and I tell you right now, your employees know 100% whether or not their feedback is valued, whether you want it. It doesn't matter what you oh, yeah. say, but they know and they're keeping stuff back. Like they're not telling you things because they know you don't care. No, or they're scared. I mean, a lot of employees are scared that they they can't uh, be vocal about things which they shouldn't be scared ever in a, a working environment because that actually puts them in tunnel vision. That makes their creativity go down. That limits them from really being able to do the best of their abilities in the workplace situation. Yeah. I mean, I've had a, I don't know if this would, you'd say this is lucky or not, but I've actually had a boss that's basically told me I don't, I, I don't care if you have anything negative to say. I don't care what you think. Uh, your job is to make sure everyone else thinks everything is good and positive, and that's that's the end of it. So I don't. Then I actually had a boss that he um, loved to rain on fear. I would go and tell him new things that I wanted to do to help keep the environment busier and to you know just basically make the workplace better. No, no. He just instantly say, no, that's not your roles and responsibility. I'm like, um, as a leader of where I was, I was managing the motor pool at a prison and I wanted to make it better for us. But I come to find out that that guy was constantly drunk at work. He hated my religion. He hated certain things, even though I was a very productive employee. And when I went to leave, man, we sure appreciate what you did. Why didn't I ever get told that? Why was I always in constant fear? I mean, when he walked in the room, I was making sure that I was not doing certain things and I was looking busy. I mean, all this different things, which in a prison environment, all I had to do is really manage inmates working on cars. And we weren't even that busy. And I produced money for them. And it just didn't work out because he just created the wrong culture to be able to have us thrive. I eventually left that job just because I had such a hard time and I hated being under the stress. Yeah. And have you ever applied for a job and wondered, why is this position open in the first place? Like, why did the last person leave this job? Is there something wrong here or was it a legitimate reason for them to leave? And there are websites now where you can go on and, and read anonymous employee reviews. So kind of get a, a gauge of the culture. But I, uh, sometimes that can be a question. You know, yeah. I'm applying for this job that sounds great, but why is there an opening? And especially when you start looking back and you see they've advertised for this position like every six months, someone new. They're yeah. looking for someone new. Maybe it's not such a great position or maybe it's just not a great place to work, you know? And 
So employees, that word is starting to spread, whether online or word of mouth, employees are getting to the point where they don't have a loyalty or allegiance to a, a company. It's more about a fulfilling career. That's what um, we look for nowadays. And so that word spreads. If you have a, a bad place to, to work, if you create an environment where they, their feedback is not um, valued, valued that word is going to spread and you will get a reputation for that. So how do you overcome that? How do you, if you're already in that pit, how do you get out of it? How do you overcome it? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about somebody that I know that they've came back with negative uh, surveys. He has told me that. Um, they won't let me come talk to him because I don't think that they want to accept that it's them. I've talked to their employees. I know it's them. I could help them with small, simple shifts to s make them look at the working place differently. I don't want to fire anybody unless they absolutely need it. But I'd rather work with them and say, you know what? I appreciate your employees. Um, I had a truck break down on me last night, my personal truck. I had it break down. And that machine is an awesome machine. I expect a lot out of it. It tows a lot of things. And so I post on Facebook, and I'm like, you know what? I am truly blessed to have this machine. But once in a while, it goes down. Was I upset? No. Was I grateful? Yeah, it broke down five miles away from uh, service area uh, for the cell phones. And so it worked out just perfectly that I was able to. And I got a great picture of a sunset and watched the sunset go down while I waited for the tow truck. And it all worked out. It all worked out, and that's the same with the employees. It's all about a reaction to what happens, because I did everything to make sure that truck was fueled, the oil change was up. I maintained my vehicles very, you know, awesome. Yeah. And it still broke down. Why should I be upset at it? Why should you be upset at employees because they're having a negative day or that you're not creating the right environment for them to thrive? You should never be upset at that. You should be asking yourself, what can I do as a leader to be able to be better, to maintain this environment, to really thrive and produce the work that it needs to? Yeah. And I think it's awesome that in this situation that you could have been really negative about, instead you notice the world around you and notice the sunset oh, yeah. and the beauty. And I saw you even posted a picture of the sunset online. You know, yeah, it hey, that, it's, a, it's all perspective. And I'll tell you a secret employees don't expect you to be perfect and don't expect everything to run well all the time. No. They are totally fine with the fact that negative things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. You might have a bad quarter. You might have a product that's not selling as well as you want. You may like, and we as human beings understand that life isn't always positive, that negative things happen. The worst thing you can do about it, though, is to lie about it or try to hide it from your employees because they know you're doing that. Yeah. So then it's not the negative thing that's the problem. It's the fact that their company's lying to them or treating them like they're dumb. That's where the problem comes in. It's not the negative, you know, it's not that poor quarterly report anymore. Now it's about you as a leader showing poor leadership. Well, and what happens with a car when it does break down like that? What are you going to do? Are you going to get upset? I honestly used to would get upset because I try to take care of my cars. I try to create the right environment for them to really thrive. But they're so great of machines. I'm not saying that people are machines, but they produce a lot of work through the day. They are the ones that produce all the energy that sells the product, that makes the, energy, the corporation run. The leaders... They can only drive it. They can only build that workplace environment to thrive and let the employees go and let them do their jobs, but make sure that you're there. That is a true servant type leader. And in that, I love being that type of servant type leader for my employees because if I can help their workday go better by me just reacting to a certain situation and being helpful instead of being like, well, why didn't you figure it out or be negative about it? There's no reason to be negative in a workplace environment. There really isn't. Yeah. And I, one of the solutions that I commonly see when they, when a leader sees that maybe there's some 
bad morale going on or whatever is they put out this anonymous suggestion box. <laughs> and and that just has to go. That it's one of the worst possible things you can do because you think you're doing something good. So you have this false sense that you're doing something good. And two, what are you actually communicating? If you put an anonymous suggestion box, what you're communicating is, is you understand that people aren't comfortable coming to you to tell you the truth, so they have to do <laughs> so bad. anonymously. You're basically admitting and um, you're telling everyone that you're okay with a culture where people aren't comfortable talking to you. Yeah. It's what, the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah. Poor car. You know, don't tell me that you're running bad or anything. I just need you to get me to my next destination. Do you think you could honestly tell a car that? I couldn't. I tried. <laughs> I tried as much as I could last night because I just wanted 20 miles more to get into Delta. I couldn't. And I was just like, I accepted it. I'm like, wow, there's a pretty heat sunset out there. Let's look at the best. And my wife's like, are you OK? I'm like, sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's part of it. I mean, we have a phone ringing in the middle of a podcast. Did we miss a beat? No. It's life. Life is not perfect. Right. And if you as a leader want to uh, create the perfect work environment, then you need to be the best that you can be and be as positive as you can be, because that will change the whole aspect about adapting to different situations, because the employees know that you have their back. You are security to them. You want them to just thrive. Because honestly, they're the ones that are doing the work. If you're doing the work, then you're micromanaging and that workplace is not doing well. Right. Yeah. I mean, I get three phone calls a day. I got all three of them right now. <laughs> yeah. you know? It's just that's life. It's, it's what happens. You have to adapt to situations. So how do you overcome this anonymous suggestion, this this uncomfortableness of actually being honest? Because no one wants to give negative feedback and nobody wants to hear it especially as a leader where you like i'm in charge i'm smarter than you because i'm a leader i don't want you you can't tell me anything bad that i'm doing anything wrong like it's just it's uncomfortable nobody wants that situation but once you can reach that point it's like it's magic it's like all this pressure is suddenly released and you're in this open environment where you can thrive and, and production goes through the roof and morale right. goes through the roof it's like this magic plateau and i'm telling you it's attainable i have Absolutely. been in situations where it is and it takes but it takes work and you time can't, and effort and, and you can't reach it and then think it's just going to stay it no. can you can kill it as well so it's, it's continuous it's hard work but when you get there it's magic it really is and as a leader the thing that you can do First of all, you need to be aware. You need to be listening. You need to be watching and observing so that you can see when something's going wrong. You see that ripple happening. And then you have to actually ask. You have to sit down and like lay it on me. Yeah. I give you full permission to tell me anything that I need to hear right now with no recriminations. And then you have to fall like you have to follow through. They tell you something hard, they tell you something you don't like. You have to bite your tongue and fulfill that promise but on the same hand you have to build your employee's confidence i have a mechanic he comes to me i don't know a lot and says i can't lately i've been going back and i'm like okay you've seen this before you're just coming to me and you're just doing this i'd be glad to come help you but you need to instill in them confidence in their abilities you hired them for a specific thing so what have i been doing lately i I've been encouraging him. Okay, so if I came and I did this, I came to help you, what would I do? Well, you'd do this, this, and this. I'm like, so let's have you do it. Yeah. You know, because mechanics is just about taking apart the right bolts and replacing the right parts in a sequence. It's not rocket science, but if you don't know that sequence and if you don't know the little tricks, then there is. And I just went and I just started encouraging him and to start thinking through because I could get after him. I hate when people say, I can't, I can't. They're in a fixed mindset. They're not going to grow, you know, but it just doesn't work out. In my mind, there is always a solution to a problem. But as a, as a leader, you're a facilitator. You need to help build that confidence in those people and your employees to say, yes, you can. And don't be in a fixed mindset saying that you can't because, you know, you're a professional in this. You sometimes need to take a step back and reflect and like, oh, yeah, this is this and this. 
But there's always a solution to a problem. You just have to step back for a minute and figure it out. But you have to build that environment of trust and security so that they feel like they can step back for a five minute break and it's like, oh, yeah, this is how that works. That's how this works. Oh, yeah, I got it. Right. And sometimes it's all about just giving them permission to to be the expert. Yeah. Just say when they come to you saying, hey, you're the expert. You do you do what you know you're supposed supposed to do. Just that little bit of confidence and control balance can change the dynamic. And I've been, you know, the, one of the the most freeing positions I was ever in was when they told me when they hired me, we're hiring you because of your expertise. We don't have it. We're depending on you to do your job and we'll listen to you. And of course, we'll conference and talk and everything. But you have the freedom to do what we're hiring you to do. Wow, that'd be amazing. And suddenly <laughs> I was able to tell my boss things that I wouldn't have normally because I had been given that permission. Unfortunately, it didn't last because like I said, it's hard work and, and it didn't last and people above my boss suddenly felt threatened. Um, they weren't on board with that. So the whole environment <laughs> so shifted. It, it, so, it so it shifted and crashed and burned. But for a while there, it was great. It really was. And because I had permission to give feedback because I was acknowledged as the person, the expert in that position. And that's the interesting part. You hire somebody with a resume and they tell you, this is my background. This is my experience. But you as a, a leader, unless you specifically came up through that same realm, shouldn't you just let them thrive in their environments? and create the environment for them to be able to produce their specialty. I mean, you wouldn't go to a teacher, a principal and go to a teacher and say, well, uh, you know, you need to teach it this way. I've got an English degree, but you're in math and this is the way you're teaching. No, the teachers go and they do what they need to do. They teach their curriculum. They're trusted by their principals to do that, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so what happens when you create this environment where your employees can give you a feedback, but you, because you have the bigger picture as a leader, you are dealing kind of with the overall arching view. You can't enact one of the things they want you to. What do you do then? You know, and I've been in that situation as well, where I had an employee who gave feedback. I had created this environment and then I, I probably, I didn't do the right thing because I couldn't give them what they wanted because it just wasn't feasible. You know, according to the budget and time and manpower and all this, it just wasn't going to happen. Unreal expectations. Yeah, it was an unreal expectation. And I don't think I communicated that very well. I, I tried to, but I don't think I did a very good job of communicating. I hear you. I understand. That would be awesome. I wish I could do that, but I just can't. And here's why. And it's okay to explain. Oh yeah, and maybe that maybe that was the the hard part for me is that as a leader, sometimes it's okay to explain why you can't do something, even though you want to be the all powerful. Like yeah, I can do anything. I'm the you leader. Have to be right? vulnerable. Yeah, you have to be able to say, "I'm sorry, that's just something that we can't do. I wish I could. It's a great idea. I'll make sure I remember that. So in the future, if we can, I will. But I just can't do that right now, and I need you to be okay with that. You have to communicate that though. Because what if you just slide your way out of it? Just like, you know, it's not in the budget. It's not this. It's not that. It's like, no, that's just not going to happen. It's about accountability. I've been studying accountability a lot lately because I had somebody that said, I will do this for you. I gave them two months to do it and they still didn't do it. I wish two months previous, they just said simply, I can't do it. Yeah. And that's that would have been just fine with me. Would I have been angry for them to not do that? Absolutely not. But why keep telling me and then all of a sudden make it an emergency for me um, that I had to run and do it like the day before I was trying to plan ahead and they, yep, I'll do it. I'll do it. I should. And I told them, please, if you're not going to be able to do it, don't tell me you can do it. That's a accountability and integrity. Leaders, you have to be accountable to your employees. They're the ones that earn and do all the work to be able to make your organization run. If you don't trust them and you don't build that environment 
how in the world do you think that they're going to thrive and produce work? Gallup says there's only 30% of employees, employees ga- uh, engaged at work. Well, why is it? Is it because of the environment? They don't feel like they're trusted? I mean, everybody wants to blame millennials. Yeah, they do have to be led differently, but it's not always them. There's always something that a leader could do better to create the right environment to thrive. Right. And there's nothing that says that their way or our way or is the right way. Mm-hmm. It, it's finding what works for the people that you have. And the individuals. Yeah. And sometimes as a, every every leader has a boss. Like Every boss has a boss. You're beholden to someone else. So sometimes you can't follow through on a on feedback or suggestion because of your boss. And your boss should be okay with you saying that that's not in line with my instructions from my boss. I'll take it up the chain. I'll let them know. We'll talk about it. But as of right now, I've been told I can't do that. Again, it's being open and communicating. People would rather hear you sit, tell them no and why than say, than vacillate and make them think that you're trying to do it and you're really not. No. Nope. Accountability. Just say that you can or you can't, and that's all right. And, and if someone comes to you for with feedback or a suggestion, it's okay to ask them question and ask them to justify that feedback. Yeah. Okay. You want me to give you extra widget to do your job. Why? How will that increase productivity? How will that help you? How would, you know, cost benefit? It's okay to ask them to justify that decision because it shows you're taking them seriously and that you are interested in their analysis and what they think and their expertise. And then at the end of the day, you need to act. And that action may be implementing or it may be explaining why you can't implement, but you can't just ignore it and hope it goes away because it just festers. It's like a ingrown hair or something. It just festers and festers. So you have to act, whether it's a ne- in a negative or a positive, you have to resolve that suggestion. So interesting point. A lot of people, for some reason, haven't been checking their oil on their cars lately. That's one of my first things is in diagnostics right now. Um, honestly, I had a car come in last night. <laughs> I feel bad, but <laughs> I was talking to the people and I'm like, did you check your oil? Oh, the oil is fine. We just had a change in April. I'm like, I don't think that people realize how much they drive. An average person drives 12,000 miles a year. That's average. You could be doing 15,000 miles. Well, that means that you're driving over a thousand miles a month. Three months ago, uh, that would be over 3,000 miles. Average car burns a quart of oil every 1,000 to 1,500 miles. It's just part of the production. We go to diagnose the car, it has one quart of oil out of five quarts. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, you have to check your oil. Speaking of which, I need to bring my truck in for an oil change. <laughs> I was thinking that the other day. <laughs> but that's the thing is, is it's like as a leader, are you seriously checking your oil? I mean, the simplest things, are you making it a positive environment? Because your positivity is what lubricates the system to keep it going. Positivity and gratitude. Gratitude goes so long because that you go up to somebody and say, you know what? I'm grateful. I saw that you did this. Um, I've been noticing that with customer service a lot lately. We went uh, to a restaurant and they were taking a little bit of time. I am not an impatient person. I know somebody's doing a job that they came apologizing to me and apologizing. And I'm just like, why are you apologizing? Well, usually you get really mad, but you're handling it really well. I'm like, you're just doing your job. And they're like, well, people are getting angry really fast at us lately. And you're kind of, you're, you're being nice. Is there something more? I'm like, no. And then I give them an extra tip and they're just like, really? You're just a nice guy. I'm like, this is how we should treat each other. I don't understand, you know, positive and gratitude, especially in the workplace environment is an absolute must. Oh, it changes everything. Perspective is, is huge. Like, I mean, a good road rage, customer service, time at a restaurant. Is it a, is it really a big deal if you have to sit and and talk to your wife for an extra 10 minutes and enjoy each other's time because you're waiting for the waitress? No, take, enjoy it. 
<laughs> it's that sunset last night was absolutely amazing. Look at my Facebook page. You'll see that my truck's there, my big red, beautiful Ford truck, and the sunrise is absolutely amazing. And I'm just like, honey, we got a chance to sit and watch a sunrise or sunset, sorry, sunset together that have beautiful oranges and the clouds and the blues and all this stuff. And people are like, what? You weren't upset about the truck? No. <laughs> I mean, sure, I'd love to have got home. I got home at like one o'clock and back up to work and, you know, everything else. But it was a really kind of fun night. We met some great people and I just don't know why I should look at the negative of it. Yeah. Because it was a good time. Well, we just recently went on a cross country trip oh. in a vehicle that has close to a million miles. So yeah. there was a great chance we were going to break down somewhere. And we just decided before we left. Hey, if we break down in the middle of South Dakota, we're just going to enjoy it. And adapt. It's an adventure. So once we took that stress, that pressure of, well, what happens if we break down it? Because we made a decision that it was going to be no big deal. It was great. Luckily, we didn't. We didn't break down. But that stress was gone. That worry the whole time that we were going to, something was going to happen was gone. Because we had already decided that we were just going to roll with it and make it part of our adventure. Well, I mean, get this car and mechanic background. I'm looking at this car. I'm like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just honestly, you know, I don't know if I would take off and, and do that because there's some remote areas and they're just like, nope, we're going. I've never driven more than 10 hours. I work on cars all the time and I should have more of a trust for them. That's one of my goals is to just take off from here and go to the Florida Keys just to do, do a drive just because um, it's just totally out of my comfort zone. But honestly, cars are awesome. And the way that they keep you climate controlled and entertained and all these things, this is all stuff that we take for granted. Yeah, that trip was <laughs> oh, we drove over 4000 miles on that car <laughs> and we never we had one where we thought something might go wrong, but it then fixed itself and. I and, love it when cars fix themselves. And we were even to the <laughs> point where we we didn't some nights we didn't even have a hotel reservation until that at late that afternoon because we didn't know where we were going to stop. Like there was no pressure to get to somewhere by that night where we would have been upset if the car broke down. See, so it, it changed the entire trip. Just switching, turning off that stressor, and making a decision to not make it a problem. So as you go as leaders, as you go into a work environment, what attitude are you bringing in? Are you bringing in a grateful, appreciative attitude that you're thankful and you're positive? That's how you fuel your team. Do you go in with a negative one? It's like putting diesel fuel into a gasoline vehicle. It's not going to end well. It really isn't. Um, why would you feel, fuel your team with negativity and with anger? Take a little bit of effort. And start looking at the great things around. Look at those sunsets. Look at those pretty colors that are around. Look at those great people that you hired to do a specific job and simply appreciate them. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. You appreciated that car. You, you guys had a great trip. It was a great trip. And it was all because your attitude right at the beginning. And did the car feel it? Could have. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Could have. Well, you know, think about it. If you would you rather that your boss tell you a sincere thank you at the end of each day or at the end of a pro you know just at appropriate times or would you rather get no thank yous throughout the year and then a gift card at Christmas? Right? Yeah. I I I don't need the gift card, but no. someone who actually just says, "Hey, thanks for your work today" is worth that's the fueling that's You're worth fueling for production because that's what get, brings you back the next day. Yeah. I mean, one day ends, you have a new day to start and the next day. Don't you want them to come in the morning fueled, ready to go and like, oh, I love my job. I mean, just think about it. I absolutely love my job. My boss is good. He, they are doing the best they can to create the right environment. They're communicating with us. Oh, white, they're showing appreciation. You are fueling your team to start every day and then learning how to adapt. Oh, there's this problem. Great. There's always a solution to a problem. Let's get that taken care of. What would you suggest first? What I would say as a leader 
And then I'd say, well, we could actually do that. But what if you collaborated with Susie over here in this area or Johnny over here? Great. They have more information instead of the negativity. Well, that's not very good. And you should be looking at it this way and just, man, yeah. the world needs more positive leaders. And to end on a positive note, <laughs> remember, you're not, you are not more special than your employees. You're still human. You are still a human. You're doing your job. They're doing their job. Show that respect. Show that gratitude. Listen, ask, and act. And you'll create an environment where people can thrive. And next week will we'll, next week will be chapter 10, and we'll talk about drive modes. I love this chapter. Uh, and this is a great chapter. So we're excited for that. So thank you again for listening to our deep dive into chapter 9. And remember to subscribe. Uh, leave a review, whether on the podcast or you're on the book book website. Purchase the book, Driving Engagement. We would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for watching, and we will catch you next time. Have a positive week. Thank you.